Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm usually for me, I'm, it's, it's, I'm afraid you might be rather disappointed. It's quite a nerdy kind of talk, this one. And I'm going to unusually for me read quite a lot of it. Um, so you may want to leave, but actually it doesn't look as if you can. So, <laughs> so uh, that won't be embarrassing for me. Um, I'm writing a book, trying to write a book, called Rules for the World Market. The thesis of the book is that what international organizations do, those that are concerned with the uh, management or regulation of the global economy, they make rules for the world market. That doesn't mean to say they're prime movers. I'm going to say they come quite low down in, the, in, in terms of causality. But they all do that, is my somewhat uh, uh, bold hypothesis. And I base this analysis exclusively on classical Marxism. And un under no account cite anything written after, published after 1867, no. Capital Volume 1, which is really the main theme of the, of the talk. And I'm going to try to... Uh, give you sufficient information in the first half of the talk to convince you that there is no more contemporary document than Capital Volume 1. And in the second part, I'm going to illustrate briefly what I think is a consistent project increasingly shared by international organizations, IMF, World Bank, OECD in particular, UNDP and others, from the 1940s, if you like, but certainly from the 1970s, I'm going to outline the, what I call the origins of the world market project at the OECD. I'm going to say, if I have time at the end, a little bit about the World Bank. But I've written a paper on that, if you want, after this to look at, you can do, on the World Development Report 2015. My, my, it's, called, it's about behavioral economics. I call it programming the poor. And it speaks to a theme that is, a, is important for this presentation, how do the international organizations set about making rules for the world market? By working as allies of states with the particular intention of offering them ways of managing and controlling and increasingly changing the attitudes and behaviors of their own population. Forget about World Bank. Speak up even louder. OK, maybe I'll move nearer the microphone. Maybe uh, you think the World Bank lends money, the IMF manages global monetary relations, OECD, who knows what the OECD does. I'm going to try to uh, persuade you that primarily they help states to develop their populations in ways that are conducive to the stability and continued expansion of global capitalism. And I'm going to do so from a specifically classical Marxist perspective while speaking up as is, you know you go to a lecture and someone says can you hear me and all the people who can't hear go what did he say what did he say <laughs> <laughs> if you can hear me in the corner can you say so can you hear me yeah. you can ish okay I'll just have to shout right so most of this is about Marx actually but I do intend to get to the contemporary stuff <laughs> Uh, later. So here's five points that underline my approach. Starting point for an analysis of systemic change in the international system should not be the system of states, geopolitics, realism, whatever, but the world market. The world market is the starting point. Second, this text, by the way, you're welcome, <coughs> I can circulate it if you like, so no, no worry with that. This does not mean that the logic of the world market, in a classical Marxist sense, has been dominant in the international system since its emergence, let alone from the beginning of time. Historical materialism we're talking about. Marx argued that the logic of capital began to take hold with the Industrial Revolution, late 1700s, early 1800s, and he said, and I agree, it would only assert itself fully when the world market was established on a genuinely global scale. What's the key for me to my approach? We are just now living that moment when the world market has a, is operating on a genuinely global scale. Only for the last 25 or 30 years. But the influx of labor from formerly state 
command or socialist societies, with other changes that you're familiar with around the developing world, only in the last 25 or 30 years can you say we have a world market in terms of exchange. We still do not have a world market in another very important sense. In other words, a market which is also characterized by capitalist relations of production. Fully proletarianized workers. You probably the various figures. ILO, for example, reckons that two-thirds of the world's workers are still in the informal sector. To use a technical term from an appendix to Capital Volume 1, they are not really subsumed to capital. So there's a long way to go in developing a global proletariat, but we can pretty much talk about a universal world market. So, what is for sure, it says here, we are at a relatively early point of the development of capitalism on a global scale as it was theoretically conceived by Marx and Engels. Capitalism may collapse tomorrow. It may have collapsed this afternoon. Unlikely, but it's possible. I'm talking about the theoretical vision that Marx and Engels had. Only when the global population that was deprived of the means of production was fully proletarianized and available for exploitation by capital to generate relative surplus value, would you have completed the, capital, the development of the bourgeois mode of production on a global scale. We are decades away from that. But it is now the agenda of the international organizations, specifically to develop the social relations of production on a global scale. So I don't think the international organizations do what the US wants or what the G7 want. I don't think they've ever done that, except in unusual circumstances. They want, and they have wanted since the Second World War onwards, to develop capitalism on a global scale. And I will be giving you some evidence for that from the OECD in the 1970s, in case you think it might be a relative uh, modern, recent thing, or even <coughs> not true. So, because we are now in the moment of the crystallization of the world market, the, the analysis of the development of social relations of production and of the world market in capital and elsewhere, in the work of Marx and Engels, is super relevant to understanding issues around the world and for understanding what is the logic of action of the international organizations that I want to talk about. Okay, so everyone knows, in inverted commas, everyone knows the quotation or the section from the manifesto of the Communist Party uh, started in Manchester in 1847, finished in London in 1848, that leads up to the statement, you'll all know it, the bourgeoisie, through its exploitation of the world market, quote, compels all nations on pain of extinction to adopt the bourgeois mode of production. That's Marx and Engels under 30 years old. If you're not under 30 years old, don't worry. Marx and Engels were exceptional. But the, they produced... Uh, you think of, you know, you talk to students, maybe even you think yourselves about Marx and Engels, two old guys with beards. They were not. When they had this dramatic uh, kind of epiphany, if you like, understanding what the consequences of the industrial revolution would be, Engels was 24 years old. Marx was 26. Don't worry, if Marx had been a PhD student, he would never have finished his PhD. But, <laughs> you've just, uh, it staggers me, the brilliance of the intuition that they, uh, that they brought to this question. They talk in the critique of German ideology. This is mid-1840s. They say, large-scale industry and with it universal competition, quote, produced world history for the very first time, insofar as it made all civilized nations and every individual member of them 
dependent for the satisfaction of their wants on the whole world. This is their sense of the world market. Go back and look at the extent of the world market at that time. We've kind of got used to it, but it's a staggering insight into the material dynamics of capitalist development. And just one more quote on this, and these are things I'm going to use in, in <coughs> analysis in a, in a bit. This is from 1849, Wage, Labour and Capital. If we now picture to ourselves this feverish, simultaneous agitation on the whole world market, it will be comprehensible how the growth, accumulation and concentration of capital results in an uninterrupted division of labour. Okay? Uninterrupted division of labour. And in the application of new and perfecting of old machinery precipitately and on an ever more gigantic scale. The more productive capital grows, the more the division of labour and the application of machinery expands. Cutting to the very basic outline of this. Marx and, uh, Marx and Engels are thinking about the bourgeois mode of production. They're not thinking about some abstract growth type theory of the kind that Spence and others expose you to these days. They were thinking about the dynamics of specifically capitalist forms of production. Two concepts are really important for them, along with the world market. Division of labor, uninterrupted, and incessant technological revolution. Those are the two things that I'm going to say are super relevant to understanding what's going on across the world today. And I'll miss out a fair chunk here. And I'll say, let's move to Capital Volume 1. Here's a quote from page 506. I just went to that bookshop down the road. What's it called? Dylan's Waterstones? They do not have a copy of Capital Volume 1, which is a shame because mine has fallen apart. I went there especially to buy one. They've got a Marxist section that's about three feet across. It's terrible. So, here's a quote. The means of communication and transport handed down from the period of manufacture soon became unbearable fetters on large-scale industry, given the feverish velocity with which it produces, its enormous extent, its constant flinging of capital and labor, from one sphere of production into another and its newly created connections with the world market. That's what's happening today. The constant flinging of labor and capital from one sector of production to another on a global scale. It was only dimly possible to envisage that 180 years ago, but that's the analysis that you find in Capital Volume 1. I want to draw your attention to two things beyond that. Uh, one, the, if you like, the contradiction between production and social reproduction in Capital Volume 1. And two, variation of labor. You may not recall reference to variation of labor in Chapter 15 of Capital Volume 1. It's fundamental to my analysis today, and I'll come to it in a moment. So here's, a, here's Marx again, talking about uh, the tendency of individual capitalists to over-exploit workers. Don't forget, this was Manchester in the 1840s. Five-year-old boys and girls working in silk and cotton manufacture in the mills, dying of tuberculosis, <coughs> parents both obliged to go to work. Nurses, or childminders, if you like, who sustained the children who were left at home by feeding them with opiates. Opium from Turkey, diluted, I've uh, forgotten the name of this wonderful liquid. And if you read the instructions on the bottle, it says, naught to ten days old, two drops. And it goes up by size of the child. So the kids were drugged on opium because the parents were at work. And if they survived to the age of five, <laughs> off they went into the factory where their lungs became contaminated and they died of tuberculosis. So Marx obviously does not subscribe to the male breadwinner model, which only comes into being 50 years later, does notice as the key feature of the Industrial Revolution the willingness of capitalists like slave owners in the United States and Brazil in particular to work workers to death 
because it made sense for them to do so. So he says, by extending the working day, uh, the unnatural extension of the working day, he says, shortens the life of the individual labourer. It would therefore seem in the interest of capital itself uh, to move in the direction of a normal working day. But mill owners rejected the reforms that eventually came in with the Factory Acts. Why is that? He says, it is in the interest of capital itself that the, the labour force should reproduce itself day by day and generation by generation. However, quote, the same is not true for the individual capitalist. Après moi le déluge is the watchword of every capitalist and every capitalist nation. Capital takes no account of the health and length of life of the worker unless society forces itself to do so. So there's a need for regulation by the state, you can say today by international organisations, because of the self-destructive contradictory characteristics built into bourgeois production by competition. So he says it's not a matter of caprice. A capitalist can't say, oh no, don't think I'll bother. I think I'll give my workers an easy time. They go out of business. They cease to exist as capitalists. Now, that's, that's a prelude to what I want to draw your attention to in particular. Chapter 15 of Capital, uh, topic, the most immediate effects of machine production on the worker. And this takes us straight to the 21st century, in case you were wondering how long it would take us to get there. So, he uh, draws a set of integrated conclusions regarding large-scale industry and its impact upon the individual. Large-scale industry, he says, brings incessant <coughs> technological revolutions as it pursues the uninterrupted division of labour and the application of new techniques to each step in the labour process. Quote, its principle, which is to view each process of production in and for itself and to resolve it into its constituent elements, division of labour, chop the task up into as many small pieces as possible, without looking first at the ability of the human hand to perform new processes brought into existence the whole modern science of technology. So anyone who says that Marx gave technology the causal uh, force in, in social change is mistaken. It was the dynamics of capitalist competition that obliged individual capitalists to look for new technologies to outcompete their rivals. It's the dynamic of capitalist competition that leads to these incessant technological revolutions, uninterrupted division of labor. So, he says, modern industry never views or treats the existing form of a production process as the definitive one. It continually transforms not only the technical basis of production, but also, quote, the functions of the worker and the social combinations of the labor process. And that leads him to talk effectively about global division of labor in services as well as, uh, as to, to create the framework for understanding, global division of labor, incessant division of labor into small tasks, the zero hours contract, and the super skilled mobile worker of today. And he explicitly describes what we're familiar with only recently in, in labor in the global economy. He says, it thereby also revolutionizes the division of labor within society and incessantly throws masses of capital and of workers from one branch of production to another. Thus, large-scale industry, by its very nature, necessitates variation of labor, the ability to do several different tasks, not just one. Fluidity of functions, you can move from one seamlessly from one area of activity to another, and the mobility of the worker in all directions. Okay, variation of labor, 
fluidity of functions and mobility of worker, workers in all directions. And he says, large-scale industry makes the recognition of variation of labor and hence the fitness of the worker for a maximum number of different kinds of labor a matter of life and death and concludes, still in chapter 15, this possibility of varying labor must become a general law of social production. Why have I spent so long talking about this? Because that was Marx's vision of the social consequences and the consequences for labor of the industrial revolution when the world market became complete. He didn't see it, didn't live to see it. That is as good a characterization as you will find of global labor today and the compulsion to continually divide up labor into smaller and smaller tasks, to search the globe for, not only for production anymore, but for services from individual workers. This is the uh, epitome of contemporary global capitalism and it's derived from a materialist, historical materialist analysis of the development of the world market under the compulsion of capitalist competition. So I think it's very clever. Summing it up so far, once underway, the Industrial Revolution gave rise to a perpetual process of technological innovation driven by competition and the needs of capital in which the cheapness of the articles produced by the factory system and the revolution in the means of transport and communication it called forth both demanded ever more new inventions and provided weapons for the conquest of foreign markets in which the impact on individuals were local effects of a world historical transformation. And capital came to require a flexible worker, available and equipped with the skills to take up different roles from one moment to another in accordance with constantly changing demands of production. And uh, if I could give you one quote and come straight to the Financial Times, August 2015, here's the final quote. That monstrosity, the disposable working population, this is the lumpen proletariat, the disposable working population held in reserve in misery for the changing requirements of capitalist exploitation must be replaced by the individual who is absolutely available for the different kinds of labor required of them. The partially developed individual who is merely the bearer of one specialized social function must be replaced by the totally developed individual for whom the different social functions are different at modes of activity they take up in turn. Well, you can probably imagine for yourselves how immediately this relates to emerging forms of labor in the 21st century. Zero hours contracts, but not only that, uh, consequential upon the, we, we, we're well aware of, for 40 years of the global division of labor in terms of production chains and so on. Now in services, because of the technological revolutions around the internet and so on, we have a, not only a global division of labor in services, but a breaking down of tasks into minute steps and a scouring of the world for the appropriate workers. I don't know how many of you work for Upwork or MTurk or, you know, if you want to make a little bit of money pretending to be a psychology research subject, you can get 0.01 cents for doing a survey for hard-pressed American PhD students on aspects of psychology. You just go to Upwork and sign up to do so. Here's a quote from the Financial Times. There's a very good series, if you've got access to it, called New World of Work. Ten articles over the last couple of months. Uh, platforms like Uber and Upwork, the US-based companies in Silicon Valley, uh, all the kind of modern technology and so on, represent, this could be Marx speaking, represent a new way 
to break jobs into piecemeal tasks and reach many more workers, potentially affecting a wider range of work. Here's, I've got lots of examples. Here's one. You, you're familiar, no doubt, with this kind of stuff. Derek Sanders, he was quoted in one of these articles, runs a UK children's drinks company called Immune. His administration and logistics assistant is in Macedonia. His sales professional in Poland. His accountant works from the UK, while Mr. Sanders himself lives between Prague and London. But now he has taken on virtual staff. You need to look at the article to see what that is. Outsourcing other parts of the business. Second example, Chris Ducker is a founder of Virtual Staff Finder in the Philippines. His business provides Filipino assistance. Think of Filipino workers abroad, domestic sales, not anymore. It's rivaling uh, other centers, of call centers and so on, but also web developers, graphic designers, and bookkeepers. So you can hire, by the hour, workers anywhere in the world. There's a very good article in the same series about Ukraine. Apparently everyone in Ukraine works for these long-distance internet-based companies. And here's a summary statement from the Financial Times Labour correspondent, Sarah O'Connor, last week, 8th of October, talking about the human cloud as a new way of getting work done. And she says, white-collar jobs are chopped into hundreds of discrete projects or tasks, then scattered worldwide into a virtual cloud of willing workers who could be anywhere in the world so long as they have an internet connection. Okay, the, the framework from Marx, I've, I haven't talked about the labor theory of value and other stuff. Simply, the world market, uninterrupted division of labor, incessant technological revolution, and how it produces the need for, and therefore results in, the skilled, mobile, fluid, varied uh, worker. So this few, this small, small section that I've quoted from, two or three pages in Capital, Volume 1, encapsulates precisely the driving logic of the world market from the point of view of workers and capitalists today. Okay, so, right, that's halfway through. So now I will turn to international organizations. So I don't want to give you the impression that international organization, there's a whole, how many people are constructivists? Go on, really? No constructivists? Good. <laughs> Constructivism is really, very stupid. <laughs> if, if it says, as some extreme constructivists do, like Mark Bly's book on great transformation, uh, stuff like that, they say it's the ideas that give rise to changes in reality. It's nonsense. There's a very good sentence in the German ideology where Marx says, ideas have no history. Ideas change because underlying material circumstances change. That's a law of history. Uh, it, it's, um, yeah, I better not continue on that vein. Or I shan't finish my talk. But, of course, ideas matter but they do not originate social change. And uh, if, if one starts working, as I've done on international organizations, more so other people who, do, who like the awful couple, not a couple, but they wrote a book, Barnett and Finnamore, apply a constructivist approach to world uh, global governance, fatal, misleading, tendentious, and utterly wrong. So, international organizations are really, really important in global governance. They can be considered, if you like, as moments in the history of the world market, same way that Marxists talk about the state as a moment in capital accumulation. Marx talks about the state in, in, in the stuff on the civil war in France as a coefficient of production. They matter, these organizations. They're you can, both, you can describe states and international organizations equally as moments or coefficients of national or global production. It's a big difference between them. States are stuck with a territorial base which causes all kinds of complications and difficulties. They have a lot of things to deal with. 
You never get a pure form of politics. They're always fighting. Look at dear Mr. Osborne and his friends. They don't know what to do. Things go wrong. International organizations don't have that problem. They sit back and think. So it's not surprising to me that it's international organizations that come out with what I call rules for the world market. That's their job. They were set up to do that. They may get them wrong. They certainly can't overcome the contradictions of global capitalism, but they are super important. And I'm going to just take one example, which is going to be the OECD in the 1970s and 80s. And I'm going to try to persuade you that consistently for the last 40 years, not just the OECD, IMF, the World Bank, all the other organizations, even the ILO and the UNDP in their own way, less so initially, more so today, are working in a concerted manner to spread, if you call it liberal ideas, if you like, but for me to spread the social relations of capitalist production. So let's give you some evidence for this. Uh, okay, so I'll skip this a little bit here. I copied it from something I wrote a long time ago. Shaping the New World Order. The OECD has had a conscious project. It's not, as you'll see from quotations, I'm not making it up. They, stuff they say and think about in their headquarters in, in Paris. So you've got lots of uh, um, important people there. If you read the statutes, the articles of the OECD, it is committed to promote policies designed, quote, to achieve the highest sustainable economic growth and employment and a rising standard of living in member countries while maintaining financial stability, thus to contribute to the development of the world economy, to contribute to sound economic expansion in member as well as non-member countries. So it has a global, understandable in the context of the late 1940s, it has a global sense of its responsibility. And uh, if you go to 1978, you find uh, an excellent document. It's called The Impact of Newly Industrializing Countries on Production and Trade in Manufactures. Before Reagan and Thatcher, after Pinochet, but before kind of Western neoliberalism, what does the General Secretary of the OECD say in the forward? This is, to me, a really important quotation because the logic of it is very clear and it's still true today. For the advance, he's talking about the benefits of supporting and developing industrialization in the NICs, the newly industrialized countries. This is a term invented by the OECD in the 1970s. They're the first people to talk about newly industrializing economies. The benefits, they say, for the advanced industrial countries, these benefits take the form of cheaper goods for consumers, a spur to increase productivity and reduced inflation at home and new and prosperous markets abroad. For the newly industrialized countries, they include higher investment, productivity and real incomes and the foreign currency needed to help finance accelerated economic development. Well, I'll skip a whole lot of stuff, but the point here is very simple. Both of those formulations in relation to the advanced countries and the developing countries center on increasing productivity. Invest in the developing world so productivity increases. How does the industrialization of the developing world increase productivity in the developed world? Simple. By facing developed countries with competition from areas where labor is cheaper. And absolutely without wavering, consistently through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and into the 21st century, OECD says every opportunity must be given to developing countries to become industrially productive, exporting industrial goods. Why? It's a class strategy. What's the logic? It's all explained in, actually in the German ideology, 1845, 
but in lots of OECD stuff as well. Country X, let's call it South Korea, Taiwan, produces industrial goods more cheaply than European and American producers. They export those goods to European and American markets. Those countries have a choice. They can protect themselves, keep those manufacturers out, or they can allow uncompetitive industries to close while a few producers invest themselves in becoming more competitive in order to compete. In other words, trade isn't just about exchange. Trade is about confronting high-cost markets with the products from low-cost markets. In the early days of the Industrial Revolution, that meant destroying textile production in South Asia. In the 21st century, it means destroying industrial production in the West. And the OECD has never faltered in promoting it, particularly because, there's a whole lot of very interesting stuff, I haven't got time to quote on this, particularly because in the 1970s, crisis of the welfare state. How are you going to overcome the crisis of the welfare state? By forcing change in developed countries. The OECD, initially without support from governments, but then with support from Thatcher and other neoliberals, is very keen to expose Western countries to competition in order to undermine trade unions, destroy the power of labor, and force investment and productive change. And if you go now to the same series, uh, the world in New World of Work, in the, one of the last of those uh, articles, there's a quotation from Stephen Scarpetta, who is the vice president or the labor uh, president of the OECD. And he says, we need to stimulate as much as possible the development of these jobs on a global scale in order to boost innovation and investment. But, he says, we do not want low pay, low skills, fighting for the, for the bottom of the ladder. We want to combine high levels of access to labor across the world with high levels of skills and high levels of productivity. So, if you look at the OECD today, if you look at the multilateral development banks, the same is true. Look at the UNCTAD, certainly if you look at the World Bank and the IMF, what are two of the strongest themes that they uh, talk about. First, in the last two years, all of those organizations have produced books promoting global production chains, advocating global production chains, as it happens especially for Africa. Not surprising, as, the, as a means of getting a foot on the ladder of industrialization. Second, they are promoting, and somewhat surprisingly, the formalization of labor. They are against, they've been not, they haven't always been against, they are against informal labor. They want proper contracts, social insurance. Why? Because if you don't have those institutions of formal labor, you don't have a labor market which boosts productivity. Very classical liberal approach from all of these organizations. They share Adam Smith's belief that the two most important things to do, this is the preface to volume one of The Wealth of Nations, half a page at the beginning of the book, what are the two things that governments need to do in order to make their nations wealthy? One, get as many people into the labor force as possible. Two, make those workers as productive as possible. That still is the approach of these international organizations. So they advise governments on social protection. How can you change your social protection laws so that instead of stimulating universal welfare, they act as a springboard to catch people who fall out of the labor market and propel them back into it? How can you uh, guarantee, as far as possible, that no individual, 
no individual with the potential to contribute to the global economy will fail to do so. Send girls to school. Obviously, I'm sure we all agree, sending girls to school, making sure women have just as good opportunities in the labour market as men, of course it's a thoroughly good thing. But the World Bank didn't take it up in the 1990s just because it's a terribly good thing. They took it up and they say so because, quote, feminism is smart economics. There's the, look, look around the world today, I'm coming to a conclusion. There are things I could have said that I haven't, but I might have time to say so in, in questions. I've got one sentence to say about the World Bank. Increasingly, these organizations are trying to encourage governments to adopt social policies, economic policies, that will change the attitudes and behavior of their citizens to make them useful, exploitable members of the uh, population. So, for example, a lot of stuff you read about, and quite right, David Harvey, Stephen Gill, these kinds of people talk about uh, accumulation by dispossession or primitive accumulation, making workers available to capital. Making workers available to capital is important, but it is no use unless you also make those workers exploitable by capital. And an unskilled worker is not efficiently exploitable by capital. So in conclusion, I've written a paper about this, as I said at the beginning, it's called Programming the Poor. Why on earth would the World Bank devote its World Development Report 2015 to behavioral economics, to these crazy, no, I shouldn't say crazy. Many of your ex excellent tutors probably do them. Um, what are they called? Random trials. You know, you get a whole bunch of uh, African uh, Gha Ghanaian women and you say, here's what you need to do. You know, your sister comes along and says, I'm very sick, I need to go to hospital. And you give her money. Don't do that. That is a very bad idea. There's, a, there's an article called Rotten Kin Networks, which is about how misguided citizens of the developing world would rather help their family in time of need than start a small business. So they say, here's what you need to do. Put a box on your mantelpiece that says, money for my children to go to school, do not touch. And put your money in there. And then if your sister comes around and says, you can say, sorry, you know. These things matter. There's a crisis in Korea, <laughs> South Korea, where traditionally children look after their parents because the parents now spend so much on their children's education, they have no resources to support. So the family-based, maybe a good thing, maybe a bad thing, but the family-based system of care is collapsing. And so Korea needs to invent a new welfare system. So the World Bank is right at the forefront in trying to shape the way that people behave. There's another, just one sentence, and I'll come to an end. They say, do you know in, uh, where is it? Kenya, probably. These guys who drive bicycle taxis. Don't know if you've ever tried riding a bicycle, driving a bicycle taxi in Nairobi or somewhere, but it's hot, and you get very sweaty, and it's not great. They say, these guys, you know, they, they know how much money they need to pay for the household stuff, and when they've made that much money, they sod off home. They don't say sod off home. They say they go home. They stop work. Why don't they carry on working until 6 o'clock and get more money? Well, it's obvious why. But it's not the mentality that the World Bank wants to inculcate. They're trying to create neoliberal citizens. My concluding point, that's what the World Bank stuff is all about. My concluding point is this. This is not by chance. And it's not because some very clever person, they are very clever people, it's not because some clever person in the OECD suddenly thought out of nothing, I know, let's get people in the developed and developing countries to be entrepreneurial. It's the logic of capital. And it's the logic of capital that was spelled out absolutely clearly and precisely in those sections of Capital Volume 1 that I read out about half an hour ago. So it's a material compulsion arising from the contradictions 
and the dynamics of the bourgeois mode of production, but from the bourgeois perspective, the OECD, the World Bank, and so on, they understand it. They know what they're doing. And if I finish off with a reference to that World Bank article, big mistake people make about the World Bank, sure you don't, when the World Bank says on its logo, a world free of poverty, they believe they mean it. They don't mean it. They just can't have a logo that says, a fully exploitable global proletariat. <laughs> Thanks very much, Paul, uh, for that. Um, so we're going to have uh, Alessandra uh, just kind of put forward some ideas uh, for a few minutes. Um, Alessandra is a lecturer in the Department of Development Studies here at SOAS, and her main focus, uh, the main focus of her research has been the political economy of the garment sector um, in India. And she looks at you know, wider processes of globalization and informalization um, and around labor standards. So Alessandra, and then we'll open it up uh, to the floor. I feel weird to use the microphone, actually. <laughs> I'm liable already, so I feel like if I shout enough, it should be all right. Um, I have a fairly daunting task here. Uh, luckily, uh, I come to this task uh, having read the paper, so, uh, which I suggest you actually do. <coughs> and also, as someone that is also a big fan of uh, Volume 1 <laughs> of Capital, for perhaps uh, different reasons that are related to uh, the methodology in the study of uh, uh, production and the abode, what Marx called the abode of production. Um, I will just, uh, rather than uh, you know, trying to resummarize the uh, uh, main points, uh, I will just directly move to some of uh, the areas uh, um, that I find really provoking in the article, so that, you know, to start uh, trying to generate debates. Because I think Paul actually raises a number of issues that are quite uh, thought-provoking at the same time. Uh, one, um, uh, they can be quite controversial uh, in, in uh, Marxist uh, theory itself. Uh, the first is how the article and the talk actually starts um, an end in relation to uh, a sort of uh, hierarchy plays between the formation of a world market and the understanding of uh, um, uh, and, and the relevance of the interstate system. So the first question that I have for Paul, in my view, is, is to what extent are we to understand these two as uh, um, um, not instead intertwined, and uh, in, in, uh, especially when uh, um, uh, in, 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 uh, in relation to the, the interplays uh, between uh, um, capitalism and imperialism. So in a sense, why are we to just choose the world market as the uh, primary framework, while instead, of course, I would expect this world market to be very much influenced by the uh, evolution of the interstate system. Uh, so why do you think you have to make this choice uh, directly at the very beginning of the paper, which is a very strong uh, choice? Uh, the second point that I'd like uh, uh, to highlight and to uh, see what, what Paul thinks of, it's in relation to the choice of uh, pitching uh, the paper uh, on international institutions in, in general. Well, as a matter of fact, we're talking about here OECD and uh, the World Bank, and perhaps <coughs> there are similar issues that can be raised in relation to the fund. Uh, so my question in this respect would be, can we actually uh, make a broader argument vis-a-vis -vis the UN bloc or is uh, instead a wider argument difficult, considering what, uh, particularly lately, has been uh, the, the um, uh, relations between different UN agencies themselves, which has shown quite forcefully uh, opposition internal to the bloc. There was uh, quite extraordinary in the last two weeks uh, a, a, a report from the Special Rapporteur on uh, uh, the World Bank and Human Rights that actually and I'm quoting, define the World Bank as a human rights free zone, treating human rights uh, as an infectious disease. So this is the UN talking about the UN, to just give you a sense. So I think uh, it would be 
uh, interesting on the basis of what uh, you put forward to try to uh, uh, address uh, some of the issues in relation to how then the international institutions uh, uh, might work or not work uh, uh, with one another. The third point relates uh, to something that comes out more in the paper than in, in the talk, but still uh, uh, when we make the argument that uh, these international institutions are effectively um, creating the Marxist vision vis-a-vis -vis the achievement of uh, a world market, um, are we saying this in a positive way <coughs> or in a negative way? So what are the political implications of uh, these observations of how the rules of the game shaped by international institutions are shaping the world market. And I'm asking this because this has been a long-standing debate in Marxism, particularly if you look at the work of Bill Warren in relation to the positive, uh, uh, I the, the potentially positive, uh, or like what Marx called the civilizing mission of capital, right? So are we still making an argument that organizing capital can be potentially good for organizing labor eventually, or instead we can also, in observing the making of these rules for the world market, come up with uh, a different political implication? The um, final point that I'd like to make, it's in relation to uh, how we understand the formation of the world market uh, as it looks like today, particularly for someone that has just spent um, uh, the majority of his research time so far in looking at the uh, actual relations of production on the ground. Because uh, there is a, a vision of the world market which is suggested here that is uh, primarily centered on exchange and uh, with the idea that uh, instead the capitalist relations of production have not spread uh, yet, if you look at uh, and, and so, so there is a, a, a particular understanding in my view of proletarianization that you're putting forward, which perhaps is not the ones that some of us that observe these trends on the ground uh, would, would necessarily abide to. So that you do observe uh, the coexistence uh, when you look at global production networks of processes of uh, formal as well as real subsumption of labor in uh, simpler terms, uh, non-factory work, uh, uh, work uh, in, in, in parallel with factory works, your EPZs with your home-based uh, workers, and uh, organize quite stably. So I'm not sure a, a lens through productivity uh, will explain the resilience of these practices. So my question is, do you still see uh, proletarianization as eventually leading to necessarily real processes of real subsumption? Uh, and again, which would be the political implications uh, of uh, this observation? Thank you very much. And I, I just uh, pass the ball <coughs> back to Paul. <laughs> Partly, I can't answer some of these questions. <laughs> Maybe this microphone better than that one, actually. So, um, I'll, be, I'll give a very brief answer to each of those. They're excellent questions, and um, yeah, world market and system of states are they intertwined? Historical materialism. I, I've got a very simple mind myself. Um, I just think, okay say people like Kalinikos and, and even uh, Justin Rosenberg and other friends of mine who talk about geopolitics a lot, I think it's a waste of time. Um, equally, I think it's a waste of time to try to explain 19th century or 18th century politics in terms of capitalism. If you take, I, I just believe what Marx and Engels said, which is, apologies, are uh, not very critical, but they said, look, we are at the beginnings of something which will become global called the bourgeois mode of production. And here's what it will look like if and when it is fully developed. And my whole argument is, it's only now that we can talk about it being sufficiently developed that its logic imposes itself on virtually every society in the world. So my answer to the question is, um, they're increasingly intertwined. The logic of the world markets, if you like, slowly colonizes every area of the world. Through these perfectly concrete material practices, export of goods that, uh, that bring a, a more advanced uh, level of d investment and division of labor into 
in, in terms of social relations of capital, backward areas, and forces change. So you, you'd be crazy to say that the world market shaped state politics and interstate relations 250 years ago, but now it does shape. That's why people who talk about war in the South China Sea, they're crazy people. There, is, there are also crazy people in the South China Sea, so who knows? But there is no chance of any rational political leader today thinking that dropping bombs on rivals is a good way to advance your state in the world. Every country is totally, you know all this, they're obsessed now with doing well in the world market, doing business indicators. I went to a, uh, a symposium in the Philippines where the Minister of Trade was saying, we've gone up from 137th to 119th in the doing business ratings. And this is a focal point. It has to be. As the world market begins to exert a real grip on a global scale, states have to respond. They can and they have responded by resisting it. But as you know from sad stories from around the world, increasingly hard to resist. So I think the answer there is, now the system of states is much more shaped by the logic of the world market than it was before and states have to define themselves in relation to it they can try and resist it but they can't ignore it and every state faces dilemmas this country britain should it stay in the eu or leave it should it drive workers further into poverty or should it not there's issues of accumulation legitimation no easy answers but the logic is, incre is increasingly just one. That wasn't a very short answer, sorry. Second one, the UN system. Again, increasingly, the UN system is being drawn in to the hard IMF World Bank line. Multilateral banks, obviously, but they're different regional focuses. They're part of the World Bank kind of system. I, well, read it and see what you think. My paper on the UNDP says, since the turn of the century, the UNDP has been colonized by the World Bank. Literally, the people they sent there from the World Bank who wrote recent World Deve uh, Human Development Reports. And in the 2012 report, they acknowledge that there is no path to human development outside of the market. They don't say just the market, but to me, they have been colonized by the World Bank. And uh, I need to see what they say in the, in the next report. It's a trilogy. The third party is yet to come. But that's my argument. There's still a difference. UNCTAD. UNDP, they're not clones of the World Bank, but increasingly they're trying to negotiate the same there is no alternative kind of logic. Political implications? I don't know. I mean, it's not a fair answer to say, but it's a bit like gravity. You know, along came, what was his name? The guy, Newton. And so I've, <laughs> I've discovered this thing called gravity. And they, nobody said, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It was just a discovery. Marx discovered the logic of the world market. Who knows what its implications will be? Who would have, just go back 10 years, look at the governments of China, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, just to pick a group from the, who would have predicted the political forms of rule in those countries today? Who knows how they're going to develop? Nobody knows. So, obviously as human beings we need to care, but there is no escaping the logic of the world market. So my, my, I'm kind of being ultra-scientific and saying, don't ask me about the um, ethical uh, stuff. Uh, will proletarianization continue inexorably until it's global? <coughs> Probably not. But uh, and if it does, it's got a long way to go. And, the, and you put your finger on the key issue. At the moment, the key issue is the confrontation. It's a bit like Trotsky said about Russia. Uh, in 19, oh, whenever, seven, five, uh, you know, the history of the Russian Revolution. If you go to the Philippines, if you go to Ukraine, if you go to all these areas, educated young people with access to the internet can be working for Google or can be web designing for SOAS or can be doing all kinds of things. Alongside, not only the kind of, kind of uh, sweatshops that they've always had, but the same sweatshops you can find easily in Manchester and in the United States, in New York. So there's this kind of cheek by jowl. But I, I'm, a, I'm a classical Marxist, and I do think the logic of development is on the side of proletarianization, uninterrupted division of labor, 
and technological revolution. But by what path and over what period of time and with what consequences, I, be, I, I certainly don't know. So. Thank you, Paul. Um, okay, so we'll open it out uh, to questions. Uh, just indicate uh, to me. Um, yes. Uh, first of all, I love the, the talk. If you can speak up, actually, because well, you can turn I the microphone. Okay. That's okay. I can speak loudly. That's ah. I love your talk. Pretend <laughs> <laughs> there's someone in here who loves capitalism and thinks productivity and, and green growth are, you know, the the answers and omitted the, the parts of your talk from their memory that, that were about Marx and you know, uh, thinks of capitalism as freedom and democracy and meritocracy. And here's the, the OECD and the World Bank and the IMF for creating citizens and rules that are conducive to spreading that all over the globe. And then they would say, so what? What's, what's wrong with that? How would you respond without quoting Marx? Because that would ruin your um, credibility to this person. <laughs> Okay. It's not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they, they do say so what? Yeah. yeah. Sh should, we, should we get a few questions? That's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get some more. Get some more. Yeah, yeah. A few questions. The so then. what question, yes. Yes. Uh, so thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, so uh, I know you base your whole analysis on Marxist framework and, and therefore historical materialism that you referred to. Um, and I know you're critical about constructivist approaches and, and those kind of things. Um, but I, I just want to share that I found the analysis extremely labor-centric. And probably that's because that's your, that's the topic that you've selected. But uh, the possibility of counter-movements on the ground, the possibility that the state is not just always pliable and cannot afford to be a passive bystander. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a number of instances in the globe in the last couple of years uh, especially, for instance, not in the context of labor, but in India, for example, there's this complete and the attempt to deregulate land use. Mm -hmm. it, it failed miserably. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of discourse and exchange of ideas on both sides before the conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, so is it, is, the question is, is there a high degree of determinism in, in, in terms of the analysis? And is it possible that there may be options that there may actually be resistance, there may actually be counter movements on the ground and alternative ideas and discourses that are stopping the, uh, the, une the, the inevitable consequence that you project, uh, which may work to some extent against your thesis. Uh, sorry, this is a bit optimistic. But no, <laughs> okay. no, 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 no. Thanks. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much for the talk. I have basically two questions. Um, one, could you maybe elaborate a bit more on how these rules actually emerge, how they actually develop. And then in combination with that, how do private rules, private regulation relate to this? Um, and then as a second question, as you talked about the OECD and the World Bank, how does the new development bank by the BRICS countries, how does that fit into this picture? Okay, thank you. I can answer this. Other questions? Yes. Uh, uh, why don't we take one more and then, uh, yeah. Go ahead. I think uh, there is one question raised by Alexander that the professor has not answered. But whether we are saying Marxists in a positive or a negative light. Now, you end up by saying the World Bank has a logo that we want the world free of poverty. But then their ultimate aim is to exploit the workers. But then, considering the poverty of the world, between poverty and <coughs> exploitation, I think people go for exploitation, compared to poverty. Then, if you are talking about exploitation, to what extent? Can we manage this? Can we link this back to the issue of inequality? Then what's, what is the way out of this? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, in a way, your question is the same as the first question. Um, there is a... I am going to quote Marx again. <laughs> Marx says in, in that pamphlet, 1849, basically says the only thing worse than being exploited by capital is not being exploited by capital. Of course, the whole point of the, of especially the uh, early stuff from Marx and Engels, is to say human ingenuity, the capacity of individuals to find innovative ways of meeting their daily needs and so on, is enormously creative and exciting and so on. But 
if it comes in a social system where the minority control the means of production and the majority are forced to work for them, then instead of being fulfilled, they are alienated. And they're working to enslave themselves to the logic of capital. Well, I, I accept that argument. It's, and it's not inconsistent with a, what seems like the opposite, where you can say, why, for example, when the Pew Research Center asks Europeans, what do you reckon the econo economy will be like in five years' time? Do you think it will be better or worse? Are you happy or unhappy with your circumstances? They all say, oh, it's going to be worse, and I'm very unhappy. 17% crazy people think it's going to be better. Well, maybe it will. But there's a very low level of support for capitalism. If you ask the same question in China, 83% say, it's just great. And there's endless numbers of documentaries you can watch, and you can read stuff, and you can talk to people. And it's, you know, it's touching. People say, yeah, I'm going to slave away in this factory. I'm going to work for 15, 16 hours a day, seven days a week, go home to my family, Chinese New Year, come back to work, and my children are going to do better than me. And they're right. They're right. So there's no denying. You'd be crazy to deny the productivity, the, the dynamic, you know, technological revolution, inventions of stuff all the time. They create absurd amounts of plenty. But you all know, all know all equally it's badly distributed, etc., etc. Well, I see Marx as a social scientist. In other words, explaining why this is. Then you can, there's a, there's a whole bunch of people who say Marx abstained from moral judgment. There's a whole lot more who deny that and say, no, he didn't. But anyway, I accept that the dynamic process of industrial transformation, even if organized under private production and profit, can still bring benefits to large numbers of people formally excluded from it. I'd be crazy not to. So, um, yeah, so if someone says, so what? What else is there? That's present in Marx as well as present in people who like it. But the liberals don't see the contradictions. And a Marxist argument would be, it's fatally flawed. And it will develop in ways that um, you know, Marx thought that when you had a genuinely global world market, capitalism would collapse. Who knows? We'll, 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 we'll find out. Number two. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah. It is labor-centric, my analysis. The relation between capital and labor is historically, overwhelmingly, by far, the most important relationship determining world history. There's no doubt about that. So when Marx says, um, world history, there wasn't always world history. It begins with the Industrial Revolution. The only thing that unifies the global population is the division of the whole of it into two classes, workers and so one of my complaints about otherwise excellent post-structural, social movement -y, identity kind of politics, the one identity that nobody cared about in the 1990s was the identity of the worker. And it's by far the most important identity in the world for shaping people's lived experience. Not just proletarians, but as you mentioned, the class struggles in the Indian countryside. The whole question of land titling and the suicides. And it's all, if you like, a, a concatenation. You can be in what looks like, but isn't, a feudal, primitive accumulation kind of confrontation uh, alongside highly skilled, world-class uh, pharmaceutical, computing, IT kind of stuff. That's the reality of global labor today. But I, do, I, don't, um, I don't think it's limiting to take labor as a focus. Also, I don't think it means that you have to say labor's going to lose. The whole, there's a huge, why would the OECD spend, I could give you acres of pages of quotations, <coughs> pointing out to governments the fragility and the perils of the situation their countries are in? You've got to do something. You've got to change things. You've got to face up to these problems. Otherwise, you'll lose control of your population. So they're acutely aware that things are balanced on a knife edge. And of course, people like myself, no doubt you as well, we like to see contestation. And we're amused to see that when Jeremy Corbyn comes along, the, the Tory press spends half its time <coughs> saying he's a complete idiot, and the other half 
responding to his complaints by introducing reforms to try to buy off genuine uh, dissent. So contestation is built in, but I, wasn't, I was talking about the OECD side and the World Bank side and not the... I think you do need to understand these dynamics to make contestation work. That's what I would say. Okay, how do these rules emerge? Oh, the, uh, Brother Jokers, they just sit in rooms writing them out. <coughs> they meet lots of people. They visit lots of countries. Really, I mean, if, say, not to advertise myself, but if you read the article Attacking Poverty, Attacking the Poor, uh, which I wrote about 2002, it just goes through the successive world development reports and it shows how each one, from 1990 up to 2001, respond in sequence to some of the problems facing global capitalism. So these are people who, if you like, in organic intellectuals. They sit back, they understand, they know perfectly well. Capitalism is contested, it's fragile, uh, it's not easy to keep it going, uh, and so they work at it. How does that relate to private rules? This is something that I need to work on more. If you look at, say, Claire Cutler's work and the, and the stuff on investment, uh, uh, protection of investment. I read a very good thesis by someone called, I can't remember her name, but it's very, very good. And um, this is a, the, the global international law aspect of regulation is just as important as what international organizations do. But it regulates capital from the perspective of private sector, if you like, and protects it. It doesn't necessarily, it in increasingly maybe regulates labor relations as well. But it's, in a, it's, a, it's a complementary area that I do need to look at more because it's very, very important. And um, the development bank. Well, the Chinese government, here's, well, go back to the first, very first question from Alexander. Um, big mistakes that people make about capitalism. This is a fault of critical IPE more than anything else. Critical IPE is a US product. You maybe don't mess with it. It's got a very short time horizon. Critical IPE starts in the 1960s, post-war boom. It looks at the crisis of the welfare state, neoliberalism. That's a very short period of global capitalist history. And it's very misleading to think, you know, I can remember, most of you can't, when people said, one day, every country will have a welfare state and we'll all be social democrats. And it will be lovely. They, in other words, there's a, there's a foreshortening of understanding of capitalism as a global phenomenon. There's a whole lot of, um, what are they called? Euro... Uh, no, no, no. People who accuse people like myself being Eurocentric. They say, oh, you're always going on about capitalism. It's very European, you know. It's not European at all. Capitalism is in its early stages. When it's mature and fully developed, it will be anything but European might be Asian, might be global. It's just a misunderstanding of capitalism as a global phenomenon to think of it as a Western thing. I come from Manchester, and that is where the Industrial Revolution started. A friend of mine says it was in the West Riding of Yorkshire, but he's mistaken. That's just a historical fact. It doesn't make capitalism Western. Marx was right. Capitalism is the first and only thing that if it develops to its full, it will transform the whole world. And we can, always we can already tell that when it does, Europe will be a, a blip, a footnote in global capitalist history. So not surprisingly, China sees itself as the next leader of the global capitalist economy. And that's what its bank is about. And um, uh, so it's kind of geopolitically you might think is different. And people rant on about that quite a lot. But it's just another step in the development of global capitalism. Should we take a few more questions? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I think I agree with you about the role of international organizations and yeah. this process. But I'm not sure if I do think that the theoretical framework you call from Marx corresponds to the role of organizations. Because uh, the division of labor and technological development are like these are both internal dynamics of production process. So these are like tendencies within the product, and uh, the way in which like these develop are like uh, 
Um, it is dependent on counter tendencies, again, during the production. Mm -hmm. However, international organizations are completely external to this process in terms of the, like, their structure, their loyalty. Like, can this be what Max didn't see? Can this be why we need still, like, globalization approach, like, globalization discussions? Because this is novel. Now capital is more organized in the form of uh, organizations. Okay, uh, Farwa, and then you, and then there was a hand. Okay, yeah. yeah. I have four um, <laughs> questions. <laughs> uh, Please, succinct, succinct. Yeah, I'll try to be very short. Um, Hans, and please correct me if I don't understand you right. Um, it's, it seems to me that you know, you're talking a lot about capitalism and how capitalism is going to Okay. Yeah. Um, you talked a lot. Um, I, I guess your um, talk focused a lot on on labor. It was very labor centric, as uh, Paul pointed out. And I was wondering. Um, and, and you were kind of arguing that, um, if I got it right, that um, kind of this development of the labor market creates the conditions for exploitation to occur. Okay. Yeah. Well. Sorry. Um, for for this, uh, for the ex expansion of capitalism to occur, um, but I, you know, as Marx himself pointed out, there are other things that are really important, like land, um, transformation of material, um, and I'm an ecological economist background myself, so energy um, has a huge role, and so I'm wondering, um, in terms of you know the limits of uh, capital expansion. Um, in ecological economics, people talk about how actually along with this continuous capitalist transformation of the world economy, you also have a continuous um, increase of meta metabolic rate, like increasing material consumption, and that there are limits to this, which can be conceived of as limits to how much energy is available. Um, also limits <coughs> to how much materials we can extract. And so I'm wondering how you think, even though theoretically capitalism can extend, in, extend infinitely, um, if you think things like um, the types of planetary <laughs> limits that we have might have a role in limiting <coughs> that extension. And then a second kind of question that comes from that is I'm wondering, um, you know, also be partly because of this that a lot of people tend to acknowledge, you know, from uh, in like peasant studies, for example, people tend to acknowledge that or try to look into how land and other kinds of things are actually increasingly more and more important. Um, so they say that peasants actually are having a growing role in contradiction to what Marx said, where he said proletarians have the biggest role. So I'm wondering. Um, how you think that the, the role of peasants, organizations like Via Campesina, the emergence of solidarity economy movements, um, environment, and emergence of environmental justice movements, how that might have a role in uh, capitalist expansion. Thanks. Okay. Um, just before I bring the last person in, are there any other questions? Because this is the last time that Paul will 
come back. Oh. Any other? <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah, and then and then you um, and then. because I'm studying international labor law I think nobody speaks about labor and working conditions or very few people even in the next week conference of historical materials there are very few papers speaking about labor so I just wanted to ask you what you think your opinion about the international labor organization at the time I think I, I know your answer but what do you think that if it's collaborate or not with this global capitalism maybe okay, you can answer your you. own question then mm -hmm. And finally, uh, yeah. Thank you for uh, thanks for the talk and also your publications. Um, it helped me to understand well about what they were doing quite a lot. Um, one of the questions I want to ask is about uh, you define the the, this, the difference between the state and the international organisations. That the international organisations do not have a territorial base, and they are mainly to spreading the load of capital. I'm not sure if I agree with that because. These international organizations, they are not formed just purely by capitalists without nations. They, they represent their own government. Um, there's a Marx, for example, Ian Woods, they explain quite clearly how these international organizations were formed in the, um, after the Second World War, particularly to enforce the new imperialist order. Um, I'm surprised that you didn't mention anything about imperialism in this um, international organizations, the background of these, because they, true, they, they work according to the logic of capital, but they, to be more exact, it's the logic of capital of U.S. interest. Um, because if we look at the IMF, for example, they have voted for the um, reforms, but it has always been blocked by the U.S., they do not want to rectify it, and also when the WTO is kind of losing the U.S. interest, so-called um, <coughs> losing it, they are trying to establish something else like the T TPP to kind to enforce it more according to the economic order. So I'm not sure if you want to explain more about that. What's your view on this? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. I think I'll pick some questions and leave others. Uh, but I, I'm happy for you to come back. Um, let me just preface this by saying that uh, yeah, th I've I've chosen. Uh, to focus today specifically on new forms of labor and really because I wanted to share with you the acuity of that discussion in chapter 15 of Capital about how the, the, the lumpen proletariat, the kind of reserve army of labor without skills or prospects has to be transformed and will be transformed as capitalist competition becomes global and this really, I mean, I've, I I'm not a great student of Marx myself. I was reading this chapter for another reason. And I came across this reference to variation of labor, fluidity of functions, mobility of the worker in all directions. And it really struck me. This is, you know, I've just been reading about zero hours contracts and nobody gets a job for life anymore. And also about these new forms of labor. And I'm sure there is something really uh, important about this observation because it derives from an analysis of the logic of the world market. So I, if you like, I'm not saying, oh, well, you know, I'm a Marxist, so this is like the Bible, I believe all this stuff. I'm saying, I surprise myself with the, when I come across this insight. How can you, you know, a 30-year-old guy in Manchester, whatever, saying, if the global economy develops under conditions of capitalist competition, eventually proletarian w class will dominate and that hasn't happened yet and that comes to your question and the survival of capitalism will only happen if workers are transformed so the alter the, the division of is that that chopping up of tasks into tiny bits and scouring the world for appropriate labor it's the ultimate competition for workers on a genuinely global scale made possible by technological revolutions that Marx can't even have dreamed of. It's not like he's got in chapter 17 of Capital, there will be this thing called the internet and people will communicate instantly. Nothing like that. It's just the general principle of competition. So this is where I'm starting from at the moment. 
And um, so let me kind of link each of these questions to that. International organizations, precisely because they stand aside from the production process, they're not capitalists. They don't represent existing forms of capital. I'm a little bit um, uh, fanciful, maybe. I say they, they represent global capital that is yet to be. In other words, their vision of a highly competitive global economy where nobody stays on top for too long and there's always new forms of innovation and competition in unforeseen places and they want to drive that process of universal competition forward regardless of who wins. So I disagree entirely with people who say they, they, the members of different countries on the IMF board or the OECD represent their countries. They don't. Uh, the US dominate, dictates what these organizations do. They can't. And the kind of stuff that people write to try to demonstrate it, I find very unconvincing. They don't have a microscopic uh, take on things. More important, if you go to the post-war period, of course it's true, US leaders said, we have got to rebuild global capitalism. Because they were terrified the alternative was global communism. There was a there was a definite, you know, the Marshall Plan, all that kind of stuff. It reflected U.S. interests as they saw it at the time. But the proper Marxist approach to take is to say they had no option but to drive the development of the global economy forward. You can put that in liberal terms. You can put it in class global terms. But they had no option but to develop capitalism. And neither Britain in the past nor the United States nor China can control or limit the development of global capitalism. We're all victims. I am, I'm, I've got two characteristics, given my age, which I won't reveal exactly, but still. My lifetime in this country coincides with the welfare state. So it's like living what I live and breathe. I paid nothing for my education, right the way through to a PhD. They gave me money. I had a, balance, I had a positive balance in my bank account. I paid for it when my daughters went to university. But my family, my, my dad was a bus conductor. We moved into public housing on my fifth birthday. We've had free health care. But it's a mistake to think, just because that's my experience, to think, well, the welfare state is the model for the world in the future. It's history. It's an it's a atypical period in the development of global capitalism. U.S. Hegemony, or supremacy, as Stephen Gill calls it. Same thing. I, dis I disagree that the UN US dictates events in the global economy today. Some people would say the opposite. But it won't last forever. Why would it? <coughs> you know, um, Venice, Holland, Britain, America, China, Indonesia, who knows? There's, it's a mistake to just be trapped in our personal experience and our, what the textbooks tell us and so on. So, the international organizations do not promote discrete, specific national interests, except in so far as you can say it's in the interest of advanced capitalist countries to develop <coughs> capitalism on a global scale. But they can't r arrest that process or stop it, and they won't. So I don't know if I quite was the answer you were, the question you were asking to be answered. Is my account of these things <coughs> stagist? No. It isn't. There's only one thing in history, and that is the development of the world market. That's it. It's a one-off process that will last until the world market collapses. So in that process, the Industrial Revolution is a really fundamental turning point, by far the most important event in world history. The completion of the world market, as we live and speak, is the second most important event in world history. The Cold War is totally unimportant. It has no importance for the course of world history in the same way that the development of capitalism as a global system does. All the people who thought 1990 was important because it was the end of the Cold War were mistaken. It was important because it was the beginning of global capitalism. And you can see that today already, and uh, at least I can. That's what I think, I should say. So, it's not stagist. Every single country within that all-encompassing world history 
has a unique trajectory which is undetermined and unpredictable in advance. All this, I don't know if anyone reads um, Hall and Soskis, you know, what's it called? Varieties of capitalism. These, uh, I shouldn't be rude. There are two varieties of capitalism. This is complete nonsense. There is one variety of capitalism, or there are 218 varieties of capitalism. There's one increasingly homogeneous global process within which there are as many varieties of capitalism as there are countries in the world. Every country, you look at this country, look at any country you study, it has a unique configuration in terms of social production, in terms of all kinds of specific local phenomena, all of them equally shaped by and responding to global capitalism in its own unique way. What, do, what does a variety of capitalism approach do? It destroys the logic of all those separate instances of capitalism and fabricates a false model, whether it's coordinated or whether it's market, whatever they call it. Those are two fictitious models that destroy the logic of the great variety of different examples around the world. So there's no telling how countries develop within this system. But it, I wouldn't say stages because it's just one history of global capitalism which is infinitely complex and varied and undetermined in its, in its development. Um, well, okay. Formal, my point on formalized labor, formalization of labor is a simple one, really, and I didn't explain it particularly well. It just so happens ILO, as well as the uh, OECD, the uh, UNCTAD, all these organizations, they've concertedly been addressing the issue of the need for formalization of labor in recent years. And my real question is why? Because it doesn't, like one or two of the questioners, it doesn't really make sense to me. Why, why are they so keen for labor to be formalized? Why do they want to get away from what has been the contribution of highly exploited informal labor around the world? Simple answer, because informal labor is not productive. It contributes to profit making, it supports productive enterprises, but it's not productive, innovative. So there's no doubt they are definitely committed to the formalization of labor. Um, and, and it wasn't that I was saying that was a good thing, but I was saying it's indicative of the approach they take to relentlessly developing the social relations of production, which is what they're about. They never go around saying, isn't it great we have sweatshops and people work for nothing and informal laborers are available. They want to get rid of that for various reasons, but the, the, the search for productivity. Productivity is the, is the main one. Okay, planetary limits. I don't know, I mean, you tell me. Uh, someone before mentioned capitalism and green growth in the same sentence. I'm not so sure about that. Capitalism is quite capable of destroying the planet. No doubt about it. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of ecological stuff in Marx and Engels, but Engels actually writes about um, deforestation and says the people who are chopping all these trees down are not intending to make the land barren and destroy it for the future, but that will be the consequence of their actions. Because he was interested in science and all this kind of stuff. There's no guarantee within the logic of capitalism or the world market that it won't destroy the planet. But people, you know, people aren't stupid. And just as Marx says, basically Marx is, says, when you need an invention, <coughs> to make more profit, someone will invent it. And I guess, I don't know, Marx might have said, if we look like destroying the planet, people who profit from having a planet will do something about it. They can still fail, but you know, LED lights instead of um, James Edison, what's his name, Edison, Thomas Edison, the light bulb, you know. Um, I, don't, I think it's an indeterminate relationship. And it's down in the end to the evolution of, of class struggle, that kind of stuff. But I don't think there's any clear message about in environmental ecology in, uh, in Marx at all. Um, proletarians would have... Yeah, why do I talk about proletarians so much? Marx didn't say proletarians dominate. He said, in the end, they will. Who knows, he could be wrong. That's why I said at the beginning, we're, we, <coughs> capitalism may not last another minute, but 
we are at the beginning of global capitalism as Marx and Engels theorized it. Doesn't mean to say that we'll ever get there, hopefully we won't. But uh, it's a long way off, the, the kind of proletarian thing. I must just finish on the ILO and imperialism very quickly. I kind of like the ILO myself. You work on the ILO or? Because they had that very nice Chilean leader. Uh, I was in Chile in 1972. And I like um, Saravia, the guy with the long white beard. He was very good. Um, ILO definitely, like UNCTAD, has a different perspective to the IMF and the World Bank. Definitely. But I, what I see is increasing convergence. So if you look at the ILO decent work agenda, different motives to the World Bank and all those guys, but they are very keen also on the formalization of labor for different reasons, but they are. And the decent work agenda is assimilable to the OECD World Bank formalization of labor agenda. And if push comes to shove, ILO people will say, yeah, you know, we, do, we believe in increasing education, productivity, all that kind of stuff. ILO, as you probably know, and UNCTAD, and even maybe the World Bank, is full of Marxists who understand class struggle perfectly well, but they've got, you know, they've got a job. So, uh, and you go back to the 1970s when Robert Cox was at the ILO, and actually Cox, to, to my disappointment, missed a lot of the debate, he mentions it, but doesn't build on it much, about the internationalization of production that was going on with Latin American and African and Asian contributors in Geneva in the 1970s, talking about specifically the internationalization of production at the same time the OECD was, <coughs> but taking a different bottom-up labor-oriented kind of perspective. So these organizations do reflect, if you like, global class positions and class struggle. But increasingly, the neoliberal line is becoming uh, hegemonic. OK, so I don't know if people are agreeing with me or not, but you're going to disagree with me now. That's for certain. I don't, take, take, I don't think imperialism is at all important in the present. It's obviously a feature of past history, imperialism. It's a disease of a transition to global capitalism. So I've got a paper, which maybe you don't want to read, from about five or six years ago, where called UN imperialism, where I say the true imperialist now is the United Nations, because it is driving global capitalism forward. It's not driving forward one particular dominant national capital, like the US or whatever. It's, it's wanting to make capitalism <coughs> genuinely global. So imperialism, to me, is an aspect of the prehistory of global capitalism. I'd probably be shot for saying that by um, several of my dear friends. But so those theorists like Ellen Wood, who is an, you read her stuff is absolutely excellent, uh, David Harvey, Leo Panich and co, I just think they're wrong. I think they, they grew up, I did too, when everyone talked about US imperialism. Uh, you know, not the most important thing, I don't think. Uh, every dominant power tries to be imperialistic while it's in control. No doubt China will do the same. It's doing already. That is not the logic of world history. That's just stuff on the side. So, and then just finally, 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 I, don't, I think you said the UN reforms. Who said that? Uh, UN. Yeah, the IMF said, increase your quotas, pay more money. And the US refused. That's not a sign the US controls the IMF. It's the opposite. The IMF has a global project. It says we've got to give China more of a voice. You guys have got to, you know, accept these changes. The fact is, since 2010, World Bank and IMF, World Bank as well, the reforms of the quota system cannot get through the US Congress, and the US is isolated now, especially in the World Bank, over the quota reforms. That, to me, that says something very simple. The project of the World Bank is not the same as the project of the US government. Has the US government got the opportunity to block it to some extent? Yes, but not to a great extent. So what's happened? The Development Bank. There's Mr. Obama, who's a great disappointment to everybody, but still, saying, or Hillary Clinton, isn't it terrible the way China started this Development Bank? Please don't have anything to do with it. David Cameron goes straight off to Beijing and signs up for it. The United States has lost control, if it ever had any, of the global system. That makes it very dangerous. It's not particularly evil any more than previous 
uh, big powers, but it's an evil. You know, look at the effects of US military power in the last 40 years, catastrophic. But it does not have the power to dictate events in the management of global capitalism. And it's been on the lo conspicuously on the losing side. And who knows if the TTP and the TTIP, or who knows if they'll succeed? I guess they won't. So don't be afraid of the United States. <laughs> I don't mean uh, individuals. In case you know, it might be American, it might not. But the United States as the leading world power, get it in perspective. It's relative, it's temporary, and uh, it's all explicable in terms of pressures to which the United States is just as subject as anybody else. Why have wages, why have adult male full-time wages stagnated in the United States since 1970? Why have they got more people on uh, food stamps than uh, most, certainly most European countries? Why is there such poverty alongside such enormous wealth? Well, because there's some evil spirit behind it all, because of the dynamics of global capitalism which have contradictory consequences. Anyway, let's just stop Leave that. it <laughs> Thanks very much, Paul, for that engaging um, uh, uh, talk and discussion. Um, two weeks from now, not next, not, not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after that, the 10th of November, we'll be meeting in here at 5 o'clock for um, Al Campbell, and he'll be speaking about updating Cuba's economic models, socialism and human development. <laughs> Um, and also, we're going to be um, in the SCR for drinks and nibbles, so feel free to join us there. Thanks for coming. It's these people, like, have you ever heard, say, Bob Jessup, for example? Have you heard Bob Jessup? He's like, or Joshua Ro or Justin Rosenberg. He basically sits there. You could write down everything you've ever published it there and then. I can't do that at all. <laughs> so, ah, you're welcome. Yes. Very prompt, I think. I don't like it.